Well, hey everyone, uh, welcome to the IDS uh, webinar. Um, this is our first webinar in 2017, and um, I just want to let you guys know that we are recording the webinar, and um, there'll be a link that you can access um, as soon as it is uh, downloaded, or yeah, downloaded and converted, and that should be within 24 to 48 hours. Um, if I can get it done sooner, I definitely will. Um, so uh, today, what we're going to do, and and that um, link will will go ahead and email you uh, that link. Uh, it should be on our YouTube channel, um, and uh, and and also our website. So on the ZSK Machines website. Um, so yeah, you'll get all that good, good stuff. Um, what we are going to do today uh, is we are going to go over some lettering, uh, small lettering, and also lettering that has been bought, uh, you know, like a, an alphabet that maybe was bought, um, you know, from a website, maybe a fancy monogram or something like that, and how we can make these purchased fonts a little bit easier for us to uh, make a design rather than importing one at a time. Um, and before we dive into this, first of all, I'm going to go ahead and show my screen. And you guys should all see my screen now. Um, the other thing I want to say is that you do have the ability to ask questions. And I will pause every so often to look at the questions and um, answer them for you. The, there should be a questions box in your uh, control panel on the right hand side for the uh, GoToWebinar. So um, you can go ahead and type that in and then um, I'll be able to see your question and whenever I get a minute to take a break, we'll go over those questions. Okay, so um, we'll go ahead and start. So I apologize if I pause for a second. I'm just looking at the questions or, um, you know, just calibrating my screen properly. So what I'm working in right now is the generate, or I'm sorry, in the IDS uh, 2.0. And um, a lot of this will be the same on the 1.3 as well. Um, but if you do have any questions about the 2.0, you can ask me, you know, after the, um, after the webinar, if you'd like, um, or you can email me. Um, and anytime you have a question, you can email me at Andrea, A-N-D-R-E-A, at zskmachines.com. So first of all, um, what I'm going to do is you can see down at the bottom of my screen, I do have a thread chart that is up. It doesn't have that many threads in there. Um, so typically I would turn that off, um, but since we are really only doing lettering, um, it doesn't matter right now for the you know the the lesson purposes, but um, in order to turn that off, I can go up to View, and then View Preferences, left click on View Preferences, and I can turn off that thread library right there. That way, I can just use my Windows colors, and just press OK. Or I could change the thread cart chart if I'd like, um, just in that in that View Preferences, or uh, or even on the um, thread toolbar. So first thing we're going to talk about are our fonts. Um, true type fonts um, are what you can use in the program. We also have some pre-digitized fonts. And true type fonts are fonts that are stored within your Windows system. So right now I'm working on Windows 10. And if I go to my start button here and right click, I can then um, go into uh, actually, I'm a little new to this Windows 10, so I apologize, but I need to get to the control panel, basically. So we'll actually go to the, um, hmm, we'll go to settings. And actually, I'm wrong. Um, I'll just type in control panel and click on the control panel. So in the control panel, you do have 
the fonts folder. If you can't see it in your category view, just go ahead and go down to the large or small icons. And when I choose that, I can then see my fonts folder. So when I click on it, or double click on it to open it up, you will see all the fonts that are installed on your computer. So you can use these fonts in um, you know, different programs such as Microsoft Word. You can use it in you know, your different graphics programs if you do have a graphics program. And if you ever want to look and see what that font may look like, you can double click on the font here. And then I, I do have a family of these fonts, so it's opening the rest of the um, fonts, you know, like if I have italic, if I have bold, bold italic, but when I double click on it, you can then see, you know, what that font looks like. And you can actually print a worksheet of it. So this is a nice way to kind of see what each one looks like, but you can preview them in IDS. Now I will tell you there are a lot of cool fonts out there. Um, that look very, very neat. Um, there's some cool wingdings that you can actually use to make designs. So you could actually use a font. Let's say in here you wanted to do a snowflake. That looks like a capital T because it's the, um, it's T-H-E. Um, and that shows you your, you know, your characters. So you can even use wingdings, dingbats, um, fonts that are, you know, symbols. So even the the and sign here, it's kind of fancy. So you can even use that too, um, which is kind of nice. But with fonts, you know, not all fonts are created equal. And this computer is pretty new, so I don't have that many fonts on here. Um, I can install fonts on my computer. And to install them, it's pretty easy. Um, you know, with the newer Windows systems. And if you've never installed a font before, it's, again, it's pretty simple. Um, but when you install fonts, you need to do it while IDS is closed. And the reason is, is because IDS will not recognize it until it's restarted. So I always tell people, when you're installing a font, just close out IDS and then install the font. So what we're going to do here is I'm going to get online and we are going to go ahead and go to a font website. One of the font websites I do like is dafont.com. And the reason I like it is that it's not clouded with all these different advertisements and things like that. Now, a word of caution, when you are downloading fonts or you're downloading anything from the internet, just be aware that you know, that of, of what you're downloading. Um, a lot of times these font websites and even free download websites will have all kinds of buttons that say click here, download here, and it looks like you're downloading the file, but in actuality, you're, you might be downloading a, a free program that they want you to install. Um, so I'm actually going to close, this is my little download bar. I am in Windows Chrome, or I'm sorry, I'm in Google Chrome. Um, so in here, it's pretty straightforward. You know, you've got the, the name of the font over here and a download button. Um, a lot of times it'll say if you can use it for personal, for, um, uh, you know, for commercial, you know, you do want to make sure that you are, using the fonts correctly too. Now there are again a lot of cool fonts out there but not all fonts are going to be good for embroidery. So for example I see this font right here this painting in the sunlight and I see that it's got like um, kind of highlights here. If I click on it I can see that these highlights will actually um, it probably won't look so great on the embroidery. Um, and let's see if we can get that bigger. Let's do large. And I'll go ahead and submit. You can preview this font. So you can see all these little lines in here, and that's not necessarily going to be great for embroidery. You know, that might look cool on print, 
or um, you know digital printing or screen printing or something like that but maybe not necessarily embroidery because it might look like your stitches are just really uh, jagged and kind of messy so not all fonts are created equal um, so I'm going to go back to the main page here and um, there's fonts too that you know they're these are really nice, but I do have to kind of keep in mind some of the attributes of this font. So like I've got some skinny little areas in here um, that I might need to change. So um, let's take this font right here and I will just click on download. When I download it, it usually downloads as a zip file. So here you can see in my downloads that um, I did download this file. It is a zip file. I'm going to go ahead and show this in my folder. So typically my downloads will go into my downloads folder. I'll go ahead and click on show folder. There is my design. I'm going to go ahead and right click on it and open with Windows Explorer. And I'm going to open with Windows Explorer because it just is a little bit easier. I'm going to go ahead and extract all the files and it says show extracted files when complete so it's going to into my downloads folder and then in a folder called that I love you I'll go ahead and hit extract and then I'm going to take the true type font and I believe you can do the the open type font but I'm going to take the true type font double click on it it's going to show me just like we saw before and you can see there's a simple button in here called install I'm just going to go ahead and click install it's installing it and now it's in within my fonts folder so I'll go ahead and close this out close everything out and um, I do want to close out IDS because it won't register it and actually I'll show you here if I go to insert text and I try to look up that font that I love you and I scroll down here go to the T's you're going to see that it's not showing yet so I don't have that font or so it seems so I'm gonna go ahead and close this out and then we're gonna go ahead and restart and we'll restart the IDS I'll go back to the insert text here and I will scroll back down to find that font and here it is so now it's showing in my text so that's why it's important to make sure to do it while IDS is closed um, I just use that as a rule of thumb so um, you know another warning is that when you do go to um, font websites you know for free fonts and things like that like I said there's a lot of different um, buttons that might be around that says download here or, you know blah 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 there's a little um, a little bit of a hint so when you put your cursor over the download button down in the bottom left hand side it's going to show you kind of the download link so under here now it's not showing me right now but right here it's going to show me if I click or if I put my cursor over that download button it shows me the link that it's going to so let's say I go to I just do a search for free fonts and we'll go to here uh, this one's pretty straightforward too so when I when I put my cursor over a lot of these links it's going to show me that so again just be aware of what um, that download link is going to so you can see down here it's going to a lazy dog zip which typically tells me okay it's a zip file it probably has that font uh, right in there um, so real quick any I'm going to check the questions box see if there's any questions about downloading uh, fonts or installing fonts um, so far so good so if you do have any questions go ahead and type them in the question box okay so let's go back to IDS and again like I said we do have true type fonts along with pre-digitized fonts now in the true type fonts um, we have various layouts that we can do 
we're going to talk a little bit about these layouts and then um, we're going to talk about small lettering and then we're going to talk about those fonts that we've purchased. So, um, and actually as a side note, fonts that you purchase can be true type fonts, but they can also be uh, fonts that are machine ready, like a DSC file. And that's, those are fonts or those are files that you have to import using the import function. So on the right hand side of our screen, we have the capital A, but you can also go to create an insert text. So anytime that you want to make embroidery designs, you would go to the create menu. And that is allowing you to grab text, to grab monogramming, to grab images, or anything from a scanner or digital camera. Now, that's not so relevant anymore. Um, we're now using more, um, you know, download files. So this would be like a direct import from a scanner. So we'll click on insert text. And when we click on insert text, the insert text dialog box does appear. I am working in millimeters, but you can work in inches and that's just going into your view preference box. Now we do have something a little bit different in the preference box. Actually, I'll cancel this out and show you real quick. That if we go to view and then view preferences, if you wanna go to you know the inch measurement unit, then all your measurement units um, for like all your settings and things like that will be in inches. But if you want to sh if you want to do all your settings in millimeters, such as your density, your pull compensation, things like that, but you want to see the design in both millimeters and inches, you can click on that and then down at the bottom right hand side on your status bar, you're going to see the design size um, kind of switch between millimeters and inches. So I do like using this because it does show me both, but I work primarily in millimeters when I'm working um, in my settings. And it's about 25.4 millimeters to an inch. One thing I do recommend if you're used to working in inches is that go online, get a nice um, you know, conversion chart and uh, from millimeters to inches and um, you know print that out, maybe laminate it, put it next to your desk, put it on your wall, something like that. So I'll go ahead and press OK. Now we're not going to see the design size, um, the, the numbers here, until we actually put something in. OK, so um, the difference between millimeters and inches is that, you know, with changing settings, and that was a question, um, with changing settings, I like to work in millimeters just because you have a smaller increment that you can work on. So let's say I just needed to bump up the density just a teensy bit. I can work in smaller increments in millimeters than I can in inches. The other side to it is that everything basically in this embroidery world is done in centimeters or, you know, it's all done in metric. So if you ever notice that on your machine, it'll tell you, you know, any, all your hoops are 15 centimeter, you know, 30 centimeter, uh, things like that, except for the mighty hoops. And the reason is, is they're made here in the U.S. Um, so the reason I, I do like more working in millimeters, again, is the settings. You know, if I need to change it just a tad, a tenth of a millimeter is much different than a tenth of an inch. So you can get a little bit more um, leeway in, in working in millimeters. So on the right hand side, I, I'm gonna hit the, um, the insert text. And with the insert text, um, again, I could go up to create an insert text. So my insert text dialog box does appear. And now I'm going to type in some text. And I am just going to type in webinar. With that, after I type it in, if I want to change anything about it, about the text, the default you can see in the text property is that it's an Arial font, the 25.4. Now, 25.4 millimeters is approximately an inch. And that is going to be to your capital letter. So your lowercase letters are going to be slightly smaller. The text path is auto, meaning that it will put it on the best fit line for that size. You have different styles that you can apply, like bold, italic, you can even use an art font, which puts it into a special shape. You can also change how the, um, the lettering sits on the baseline. Um, 
On the right hand side, you also have the ability to change the color before it goes in. You have the ability to apply small lettering um, stitch settings to it, and you also have the ability to apply a vertical layout. We're not going to go over those just yet, but we're going to go over the main text properties, which is the font, the size, and the text path, uh, as well as the style. So I don't have anything selected, and I can see that it's not selected because nothing is highlighted. I can select one letter at a time if I'd like. I can select the whole area at one time, um, and it's just a left click, hold, and drag to select everything. Now when I select everything, I am going to change everything. So in my font list, I do, I can uh, scroll through this, and I just want to scroll up and I'm going to show you, these are the letters with the at sign are the pre-digitized fonts, and again, we'll go over that when we kind of go over some small lettering stuff. Um, the TT means true type. So even though it has an at sign in front of it, but a TT, the true type, uh, it's still a true type. That's just the name of the font. That's how the font was named is an at sign and then the name. Um, a lot of times uh, these are fonts that are used with different languages. Um, so if I click on one, it is you can see that the, the preview does show you that true type font. Um, I will show you a difference that if you are using a pre-digitized font, it's going to show you the preview in here, but not necessarily up here. So you can see it's more of a wireframe. These these letters are broken up into separate pieces, um, more in manual digitizing. So let's go down to the font that we just installed, just for fun. And you can see it's a little bit of a, a thinner font. Um, and you know we can we can bulk that up just by hitting the bold button. You know we can make that a little bit bolder. Um, we can also change the size. We can either use the drop down and change the size in here, and that's going to be a pretty big font. Or we can highlight and say I know that I want it to be 22 millimeters or whatever it may be. The text path. With the text path, you can change the text path to whatever um, you know, whatever is available. An auto is going to put it on the best fit line. A line you can draw your own. An arc you can draw your own. Ellipse you can draw your own circle or oval. And then a freehand you can actually draw a line with multiple points. The line here is drawing with two points. So a freehand is drawing with multiple points. I'm going to left click on auto and leave it on bold. You can italicize as well, but I'm just going to leave it on, on bold for now. Right now we do have above the line. We also have centered on the line and below the line. Above the line, it's going to put all the letters that, you know, um, sit, they're going to, you know, they're going to sit on that line. So all the letters are going to be above that line. So I'll go ahead and press OK. Now when I press OK, one thing I do want to show you is that I am in the outline view, so that's why I'm seeing my wireframe. So I'm in view outline, you can see that right up here. If you're not sure, you can go to view and view outline. Um, once that is in, you can see that the letters are sitting on the auto baseline, and you can see that um, you know, I put it on its on the best fit line, and the letters are sitting on top of the baseline. Now, if you did have a G or you know uh, something that had something a little bit below, it would have that you know that tail or whatever it may be below there. So I'm just going to hit the go button, and when I hit go, it'll put the stitches in there for me. So it, it's going to follow that outline. I did see some things that looked a little funny on that A. And I just want to show you here that, you know, even though fonts, um, they're usually pretty good, but you can see here I've got some funky things going on. And when I look at that view outline, I actually have a hole here. I actually have a hole here too. And, and I can see that if I right click inside that area, you can see there's a hole right there. And, you know, sometimes fonts, they're they're not always 100% perfect. Some fonts are, some fonts aren't. 
I see a couple of things in here that would actually, you know, you know, can affect my stitching, and that is this hole right here. Since I have the hole there, I am in the outline view, so the outline view allows me to fix any of this artwork or these outlines. And if I go up to outline on the main menu bar, I do have a tool called fill a void. So I do have to make sure it's right click selected, otherwise I cannot get into these tools. So I'm going to scroll over to fill a void, left click on it, place my cursor over that void and you can see that it highlights. That's showing me, okay, well that's a void that can be filled. Here's a void that also can be filled, but then it would close up my A. I'm going to left click on this fill a void here and press escape to get out of the tool. Now, I also see some little other things that that kind of bother me a little bit and what I'm going to do is I'm going to zoom in even closer to show you what's sticking out at me. I'm not sure if this is a void right here or if it's just a, a funky outline. So I'm going to press escape to get out of that tool and to see that I'm just going to go up to outline and edit outline mode and you can see you've got you know you got some funky lines going on here. So my stitches are actually going to follow that. So maybe I want to clean that up a little bit. To clean it up, I can move the nodes, I can delete nodes, and in this instance, I'm going to take this node, I can left click on it, it selects it. If I want to move it, I can left click, hold, and drag. So I can see, you know, that you've got some, you know, it's, it's just got something funky going on here. Um, I'm actually going to right click on it and then hit delete point. I'll say yes, because I'm actually going to fix this one too. Um, this one, it's got some, these are the angles that actually come out away from that node. And I'm going to right click on that, whoops, I'm going to right click on this one and delete it. And then, I, after I deleted those points, you can see it looks a lot nicer, but I maybe still want to, uh, you know, kind of change it around a little bit. If I left click, hold and drag on that red line, it adds a node. I can alter the angles of it just by placing my cursor over the angle and then moving it. I can make that, you know, a little bit better. If I right click here and I delete that point, I then can right click on the line. When I right click on the line, it, you know, kind of, uh, it, it makes it smooth or it allows me to move that line with uh, like a kind of an arc. If I left click, hold and drag, it adds a node. Now I'll just hit the undo button. And what I'll do is I'm going to click on zoom selected object. I'm selected on that A, click on zoom selected object. I also see here that it's a little funky. Um, so I'm going to zoom in here. I just left click on the zoom in tool, left click, hold and drag, press escape to get out of the tool. And I can right click, delete the point right click, delete the point, right click, delete the point, I'll hit yes, and I'll right click here and delete the point. So let's go back to zoom selected object and it cleaned up, you know, we cleaned up that area. I'll go ahead and hit the go button again. It is, it's just going to regenerate that piece and now I can see that my stitches look much better than before. So let's go ahead and hit one to one. I'll right click off to the side to deselect. And so it is, you know, when, when you're working with true type fonts and you're getting them, you know, from different sites, you know, some are good, some might need a little, you know, cleanup, um, but you have all the ability to do that cleanup. So it looks like I have a question here. I'm gonna go ahead and pull that up. Um, so as far as, uh, I got your question about the update. Um, I'll go ahead and email you, uh, Miguel, about that. So, um, okay. So, anything, any other questions so far? So, you know, when you do import, or not import, I'm sorry, when you do bring in lettering, it is, you know, important to kind of look at the, um, the view outline. And you can see, you know, on this N here, I do have, you know, that little hole right there. If you're not sure it's, if it's a hole, just keep zooming in on that area. Uh, but here I'll just quickly go to outline. And again, I'm in the outline view. Um, 
If I'm not in outline view, it won't show outline up here. These are where all my tools are, um, are stored. So I'm going to go to fill void, fill a void, put my cursor over that void, left click, and fill it up. Press escape to get out of the tool. Right click off to the side to deselect. And when I hit go, it's going to re, um, it's going to regenerate the whole thing. So, um, yeah, so it's always a good idea to kind of, you know, go over those letters a little bit and make sure things aren't going to, you know, mess, have like a little hole in there or whatnot. So I'm going to click on Zoom All Design, and then I'm going to click on, actually, I'm going to click on the, um, on the Zoom toolbar. I'm going to go to about 200%. And I just use the drop down arrow to go to that 200%. When I left click on my lettering, you do have your lettering tools which allow you to change the spacing, to change the sizing, and um, also kind of the layout of the text line. So, and we also have this edit button. The edit button allows us to go back and update the text if necessary. So like if I did not want it on a straight line and I wanted to put it on an arc, I can always hit that edit button and change it. But for now, we'll talk about the, um, we'll kind of go over these a little bit quicker, um, but the white diamonds on each text path, they're going to be very similar in that it's going to move the appropriate letter along that baseline that's defined. So if I place my cursor over one of the diamonds and left click on it, well, first of all, my cursor has to turn into a crosshair. Once it's a crosshair, I could then left click on it. And I just left clicked once. When I place my cursor back over that, and that green um, may means that it is selected, I can now left click, hold, and drag on that baseline. You'll see that it will stop you know, at the end of the baseline. So if I wanted to, you know, move it out a little bit, I can certainly do that. I can left click, and then if I want to move to another one, I just put my cursor over that diamond, left click, and then left click, hold, and drag. But for, for this, it looks like it's pretty, pretty good. Um, if I do want to move multiple, I can hold my control key after one is selected, hold my control key, and left click. Now, control allows you to select multiple or deselect what's already selected. So I am holding the control key on the key, keyboard in doing this. Once I select the ones that I want to select, I let go of the control key and then place my cursor over one of them. It doesn't matter which one. Left click, hold, and drag, and you can drag all of them, and you can see we can even stack them on top of each other if we wanted to. But it is going to stop at the end or the beginning of that baseline. Now, if you just want to deselect everything and go back in, you can left click off to the side. It deselects everything. Left click again, and you can see that it's kind of reset in that you have nothing selected. The other white tools, uh, you have two arrows pointing up and you have an arrow pointing to the right. The first arrow pointing up, which is above the last letter, if I left click, hold, and drag, it drags it up. I can actually scrunch it down and I can mirror as well. Now this is similar in the, um, in the straight text path to the top and bottom nodes. These eight black nodes are sizing nodes, um, and these you can use on anything that you create in IDS. When you bring in a DST and you want to resize it, you want to make sure that you're doing it through the resize box with the apply stitch processing. The resize box is just down here at the bottom, and then apply stitch processing. You do not have to do that with images or designs or lettering that you create in IDS. Okay, so only when you have DST files uh, or any imported files, you want to apply the stitch processing and size it through here. Otherwise, your stitches will not uh, recalculate. So when I do resize things, I do want to hit the generate button 
and you can see my stitch count down here is 2393. I did pull the letters up a little bit and I'll hit the go button and then you can see down here it's 2473. And you can see over here on the design size, see how it's rotating through the millimeters and the inches. So you can see it's about, you know, an inch tall, about 3.7 wide, 94.06, you know, so it's giving you both. It's kind of nice that way. Um, the top and bottom black nodes will do your sizing. And depending upon if you put your cursor on the top or the bottom, it's going to pull it from that opposite side. So just like the white arrow, it's pulling it from the bottom up. The middle top, when I put my cursor over on top of it, it's going to turn into a two-way arrow. I can left click, hold and drag, it's pulling it from the bottom up and mirroring it. Now. When I size using these tools, I do like to use a shift, my shift button. And actually, before I do that, I'll go to the bottom one, I'll left click, hold, and drag. You can see that it's pulling it from the top down. And you can mirror it that way too. Although, if I hold my shift key while I am sizing, I'm holding shift right now, it's doing it from the center. So this arrow right here, when you are on a straight line, it's pulling it up from that baseline. This one is going to be from the bounding box, from the top or the bottom. So this one would pull it from the bottom up or from the bottom down. Same thing with left and right. Uh, it's going to be according to the bounding box. So imagine this box around the lettering. And if I put my cursor over that box, and it turns into a two-way arrow. Left click, hold and drag. It will drag it from the right to the left or squeeze it or mirror. And then from the right hand side, you can do the same thing, squeeze or mirror or stretch. But if I hold shift, it will do it from the center. And these tools, you can this these little tint, hints on these um, eight black nodes, you can apply to images as well that you that you create in the program. Anytime I resize, reshape, anything like that, I do want to hit go and have that recalculate my stitches. So you can see now my stitch count went down to 1984. The corners are going to do X and Y. So it will pull from, pull or, you know, shrink or mirror from that opposite corner that you're pulling from. And again, if you hold the shift key while doing so, it will do it from the center. I do like using the shift key quite a bit when I am resizing. Um, it just, I don't know, it's just one of the preferences I have. Okay, so those are the eight black nodes and the arrow pointing up. The arrow pointing up next to the last letter on our straight text path is going to stair step our letters. So I am going to left click, hold and drag and you can now see my letters will stair step or I can go completely vertical which you you know you can choose that vertical option in your settings um, when we go to insert text but you can do it this way as well. So you can you know you can go in many different directions here. Now, realize that when I am stair-stepping or using this tool, the lettering is staying at 90 degrees to that original baseline. So that straight baseline, it's staying perpendicular to that. My letters are not, um, you know, not tilting along with the baseline. So I'm just going to get that back to a straight baseline. And an easier way to do that, let's just hit the undo button up here. <laughs> On the right hand side, I do have um, the ability to stretch out my baseline. So I can left click, hold and drag and stretch that baseline out. It's pulling the letters uh, appropriately, stretching the, the letters out. We can also squish them together and also invert our letters. So that's a way to, you know, move with all the letters. Um, instead of using these little tools here. 
And of course, after I do that, I can move these, um, these white diamonds. Now, as uh, a side note, um, once you, know, you bring in lettering, it's going to keep these properties. But if you do ungroup your lettering and try to group it back together, those properties go away. So all these white diamonds, um, the white arrows, the edit button goes away if you ungroup. So just as an example here, so if I were to ungroup, each letter would have its own bounding box. So if I go to edit and group ungroup, you can see now our letters have their, their own bounding box. So if I left click off to the side and now left click on a letter, each letter is its own piece. And there's benefits to do that, um, you know, for certain things. But um, if I try to take it and group it back together, edit, group, ungroup, it loses the white diamonds. It has the, you know, it still has the eight black nodes, but it loses the white diamonds. So just keep that in mind if you, you know, working with the text. So I hit the undo button two times and it allowed me to go back to my text path. Now you can edit our text path. Um, I'm going to hit the edit button here. Um, I'm going to leave it on the current line. So, um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to change it to where it's centered on the line. I do like to do this with arcs and I'll show you that in a minute, but I'll leave it on centered on the line and press OK. When I do that, my lettering now strikes through the baseline. So it's half of it's going on top and half of it's going on bottom. And that's going to be according to the capital or the taller letters. I hit the edit button here. I'll click below the line. We'll press OK and you can see now it's below the line. So you have the ability to change you know, where it is on the baseline. I'll change it back to above the line and press OK. All right, so if I want to edit this and I'm editing on a straight text path, um, so it's it's going to you know stay pretty pretty normal. If I do go through a lot of changes and then hit edit and change that baseline, you might see some funky things going on. So if you go through a lot of edits and then you decide to say, oh, I want to just scratch it and start over, I recommend just deleting it and starting over. So I'm just going to hit edit here, and when I hit edit. I'm going to change from current line to line. I'm going to leave it above the baseline and I'll press OK. When I press OK, my cursor turns into a crosshair and with drawing my own line, it's going to keep the letters perpendicular to the line that I draw. It also counts what direction you're going. So if I go from left to right or right to left, my letters can be affected that way. I always recommend going in reading order from left to right. So if I'm going to, if I want to uh, draw a line on a diagonal or I have a fixed line that I need to draw it on, um, a couple ways I can do this, I can left click hold and drag or I can left click once and left click again So to create two anchor points. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to uh, put this on a diagonal, I'm going to left click one time. If I don't like the point that I just made, I can always hit my backspace key. But as soon as I make that second anchor point, it's going to um, put in, you know, it's, it's going to uh, set that line. So if I don't like where I started, I can hit backspace and go back one at a time. I go left click, oops, left click and left click. And once I left click that second time, it's going to set that. So now you can see the letters are perpendicular to that line. Okay, I'm going to pause for a second. It looks like um, we have a question. If we ungroup the letters, how do you space them evenly? That's a great question. So I'm going to hit the undo button here. And if we do ungroup the letters, I'll go to edit, group, ungroup. I can move the letters, you know, with my mouse. When I left click on a letter, it selects that letter. I can move it with my mouse with that four-way arrow if I just left click, hold, and drag. But you can see I can, you know, I can move it in any direction. I'll hit the undo button, get it back into, into place. The other thing I can do, and again, it's not just with lettering, but anything that you have selected, you can use the arrow keys on your keyboard. So if I use the left arrow, I'm just holding it down. I can move it over. 
So there are ways to kind of emulate that those those diamonds. I can move it up, I can move it down. So I can use you know any one of those um, any one of those arrows. In addition, if I hold the control key while moving it on my screen, I can keep it on the X or Y axis. So you can also um, change the spacing that way should you need to after you've ungrouped it. Okay, great question. And then after you do that, you can you you can group it back together. But again, you do miss those um, those tools, those white diamond tools. So we're just going to go to a new file, file and new, and I'm going to go to insert text, and we'll change the text path to arc, and press OK. And again, I like to do centered on the line on the arc, just because. It allows, um, I think it's a little bit more balanced that way. So I'll press OK. And once I press OK, my lettering is on screen. So you can see um, our letters are striking through the baseline. I'm going to left click here, come over, and left click here. So the first two points that I make, I'm setting the baseline in that I'm setting the two. Um, parameters of how long that baseline is going to be. Now you can see my cursor is very close to those nodes and you can see my arc is going crazy. If I move my cursor closer to the middle of the line, I have a much smoother transition for that arc. Once I am happy with the arc, I'll go ahead and left click and now my lettering is on, the, on that arc and it's centered on that baseline. A new tool that we have is this, um, this arrow pointing up in the middle of our lettering, and that allows me to change that arc. So if I don't like how high that arc, or, you know, the, the, the arc of the arc, I can change that. So you can see I can go positive or negative without having to redraw it. Um, these tools will all do something similar in that it's squeezing the letters, stretching. Now you can see it's doing it from the center. And the reason it's doing it from the center is because that's where my baseline is, or that's how I have my letters sitting on the baseline. And then this one is going to bring out, kind of make that circle bigger or smaller for that arc. So um, if I hit edit, I just want to show you that if I do above the line, first look at it, that it's centered on the line, I'll press OK. You're going to see my letters look like it, they're a little bit more spaced out. So just watch the tails here, press OK, see how they get closer. And then if I do below the line, press OK. You can see they're even closer. So that does change. I mean, as far as a straight line, it, you know, it doesn't change too much uh, um, because it's straight. But when you're doing arcs and you're doing ellipses and circles, um, it can change, you know, quite a bit. So um, a good question here is how would we make the stitch correctly for a hat? And that is um, with with hat and cap embroidery, um, you want to look at the stitch um, sequence. Typically with hats, when we do uh, stitching on hats, um, you know, you're stitching on a curved surface. Not only are you stitching on a curved surface, but you have one side of the hat that's being anchored. So there's more play in the hat when, you know, the, the cylinder is turning and, um, your, you know, your hat is turning. Plus you have you know, a little bit of movement within the hat. So stitch sequence is going to be kind of a big part of, uh, you know, hat embroidery or, you know, digitizing for a cap. And that is going to be over here on the left-hand side. You'll see that appear as soon as I hit the go button. So typically with hats, we want to start in the center and move, you know, on either side. Um, when we do that, we can change that through the stitch sequence viewer right here, or we can go up to accessories and uh, set stitching order. 
when we click on set stitching order, this is kind of my preferred method um, with something more simple um, like lettering because I can go over and I can say, okay, stitch this first, put my hand over that eye and left click. It will show you over here on the left hand side on our stitch sequence viewer what is um, what I just selected. And then I want to do the, uh, the dot of the eye. So you can see now one, two. If I do something incorrectly, let's say I do the E as number three, but I really wanted the B, I can always hit backspace. There's the B, then the E, and then the W. Now I could come back to the NAR, but I see that that's already correct. So I just hit enter on my keyboard, and when I hit enter, it re-sequences um, that. I'll right click off to the side to deselect, and I'll generate my stitches. Oh, whoops, I'm sorry. I did not hit enter. Let's go back. So you have to hit enter before you hit escape. One, two, three, four, five, enter. Press escape to get out of the tool and generate the stitches. Oh, right click off to the side and regenerate after I right click off to the side because I want to regenerate the whole thing. So now it's stitching from the center out. When you're doing an outline around the design, um, you know, more with block letters and something that's connected like this, you want to do the letter, then the outline, letter, then the outline, because you have the least amount of movement when you do that. Whereas if you do all the letters and then all the outline, you have more movement when you're stitching than, um, than if you do the letter and then the outline. That is kind of the same idea when you're doing large jacket back. And with large jacket back, you have more movement in the fabric. And so when you have that, that movement in the fabric, um, you want to, your detail work and your outlines and things like that, you want to keep them close together. You might have more color changes that way, but, you know, you do want to keep that type of, um, you know, that type of stitching, you know, closer together, like I said, um, because that, you know, that, uh, what else can I say, movement in the fabric is going to happen. Okay, so another question, how about the foam on hats? Is it the same? Um, when stitching foam on hats, uh, you do want to create kind of, you know, from the center out, um, but it all kind of depends on the letter that you're doing. You know, we do have to break up the letter and foam, I think we'll do in another session. That's a whole other um, type of embroidery, but, um, you know, foam on hats, it's, uh, you know, it's a special procedure to do that, a special technique, and you do want to try to keep it as balanced as possible, you know, going from the center out, but it all kind of depends on your design and things like that. Um, so how do we create an outline around the lettering? Uh, great question. Now, this lettering is a little bit different. Um, we can create an outline um, automatically, uh, but with this design, because it is kind of connected, when we do create an outline, um, when I right click on an area, it will outline that area. So if I right click, hold, and drag around the entire lettering, you can see that each letter is its own piece. Okay. This is a little tricky. Um, so when I select all the letters with a right click, and again, you know, I'd have to fill these two little holes up. So I'm going to go up to View and then View Outline. And the reason I want to fill them up is because um, I don't want stitching inside there um, as far as the outline goes. So I'll go up to Outline and create outline, oh, I'm sorry, I want to go to fill void, fill a void, and I go over these two guys right here, left click and left click, and press escape to get out of the tool. And again, this is important, um, you know, to, to clean up your areas before you put in an outline, and I'll show you, I can see this being a problem area right here um, when we do put in an outline. So we'll go 
we can be in the stitch mode, we can be in the angle mode, we can be, be in the outline mode, it doesn't matter which one, but I go to stitch, create outline from area edges. When I do that, it asks me, okay, what kind of border do you want? I'll do a satin border uh, right now, or actually this is kind of thin lettering. Well, it doesn't matter. I'm going to do a satin border right now, and I want to do all borders because I have the inside of an E, I have the inside of an A, the R, you know, so on and so forth. This, um, I would probably recommend doing outlines a little bit of a different way, just because, again, it's really skinny on the inside. You've got, um, I might choose more of a manual way. And unfortunately, I don't know if we'll have time for that right now, but that, again, maybe we can do that next time. Um, but like I said, more, maybe more of a manual way, uh, because what this does is it creates a line on this blue and white flashing line. The blue and white flashing line is my zero offset. So if I leave my line uh, or my outline at the zero offset, it's going to create a line right on top of that blue and white flashing line. And then it's going to put my um, satin stitching, um, you know, at a width of one millimeter on that. I can change the size here. I can change the size later. The offset you can't change later. You do that when you initially create it. So I'll go ahead and press OK. And after I press OK, it's going to draw the line. You can now see those lines. And you can see down here at the bottom it says satin border. I'm going to left click on the color because it does default to the color that I'm working on. And let's go ahead and change it to orange. Press OK. And now um, I have an outline around each one of my letters. If I right click off to the side, you can see now I have an outline around each one of my letters. In here, um, I do have, you see that little loop? If I right click on that outline, that outline is also doing that little loop. Um, on the areas that are skinnier, um, it might look a little messy. Let's go ahead and zoom in and go to my stitch view. You can see that there because it's such, such a tight area. So I might, like I said, I on something like this, I would probably recommend doing it a little bit differently. And um, maybe for next time, I'm going to go ahead and write a note that uh, we've got interest in the foam as well as the, you know, the kind of outlining for something like that. But for block lettering, you know, bigger areas, it does look a little bit better. When I left click on a color chip on the left hand side, I can select those letters, or I'm sorry, I can select those areas or lines that is that color. So for something like this, maybe I want to change it to a triple run, which I come down to my quick stitch type and change it to a triple run. Looks a lot nicer, especially on the inside there. But like I said, maybe we want to take a different approach to uh, the outlining for this type of lettering. All right. So great questions. Um, I'm going to go ahead and hit the one-to-one, -one, which brings it to, you know, 100%. Uh, and with that selected, I'm just going to do a control delete. Control delete allows me to completely delete the area when the area is right clicked on. I left click on my lettering again. I still have those tools. And, and one more thing is that if you do create outlines um, with that outline tool, uh, it will stick the outline to the letters. So I just hit the undo button. If I do move that letter, it moves the outline with it. Okay, so let's go ahead and control delete. And now we left click on our lettering and we still have the editing tools here. I click on edit. I'm going to change it from current arc to ellipse. I'm going to um, change it to back to centered on the line and press OK. Now when I do an ellipse or a circle, I usually start in one corner and drag to the opposite corner. So I'm going to start in the upper left hand corner, left click hold and drag, and I'm dragging it down to the lower right hand corner. If I hold the control key, I can do an oval, whereas if I don't, I can do a circle. Now this is going to put our letters around the complete circle. I let go of the left click. I have two options here with the white arrows. I can pull that out or I can change. 
oops, change the uh, size, you know, pulling it from the center like I did before. This I don't use very often. Um, you can use this in some creative ways with like uh, dingbats or, you know, some some cool like, uh, um, you know, lettering that might have symbols instead of letters and create kind of like a monogram frame or, you know, create some sort of frame around something else. Um, I don't, again, I don't typically use it for letters, but, you know, everybody will find a way to use the different tools. So I will hit the edit button one more time and I'm going to change it to freehand. And with freehand, I can use my own uh, points, I can draw my own points. So I'll go ahead and hit OK. And again, I'm going to start in reading order from left to right. I'm going to start over here and make a left click. Left click is a corner point. And then a right click is a smooth point. If I don't like a point that I made, I can always hit backspace. So I can go back one at a time. And I can start over. Right click, right click, right click left click and I can keep going but once I'm done I can hit enter and now I've got my lettering on that baseline I do have it centered on the line and I can still change it to where if I want to do above the line press OK now it is going to look a little bit different just because of the curves that I've got going on here below the line so you can see it kind of jumbles up on this side whereas it's more spread out on that side. But I do like using centered on the line quite a bit. Okay. So we'll go ahead and zoom the whole design. And you can see, you know, the things that we've changed. I'll go ahead and regenerate my stitches and make sure that, um, you know, it recalculates because we've, we have done some changes as far as size and whatnot goes. Okay, so those are, you know, our text paths along with the, um, the tools. And again, the tools are a little bit different depending upon what text path you're on um, as far as the white arrows go. You know, this one, again, it's going to, you know, size it. Although, let's go ahead and zoom out a bit. And I just left click on the zoom out tool and single left click, press escape to get out of the tool. And then, you know, you can see that it's, as it's stretching it out, it's stretching it going in the same direction as our last points were made um, because there's no points beyond that. And then this one's a little bit funky, just kind of depends on how you draw your text path, but it's kind of like a stair step. So lots that you can do. Again, you can use, you know, some cool fonts like uh, Wingdings and Dingbats and, you know, just different fonts um, to create your lettering. So let's go to a new design. And I want to talk about small lettering. Um, with small lettering, the biggest thing is that, that is a very, it's a hard thing to do. You know, it's, it's something that you do have to spend time on because it is, so, you know, it is such a challenge. Um, with small lettering, I'm going to kind of preface it with this, is that, and those of you that I've talked to before about small lettering, I'm sure you've heard it, is that with the small lettering, you want to use, you know, a, a smaller needle and a smaller thread. Um, with the, okay, sorry, I just read a quick question that I'll go over later. Um, with the small lettering, um, what you're trying to do is you're trying to put stitches into an area um, or into a fabric, I should say, with, and you're trying to read really small letters. I mean, you think about, I typically tell people you don't want to go below a quarter of an inch just because, um, you know, on, on, there are times that you will go below a quarter of an inch for special applications. I have seen that. Um, but typically, you know, in the, the broad scheme of things, with a left chest logo, you typically don't want to go below a quarter of an inch. And the reason is, is, is purely for reading the logo, you know, reading that portion of the logo. The other thing is, is that when you stitch with a certain weight thread, like the standard 40 weight thread, and you're putting 
that thread into the fabric, you're, you know, you have a little bit of bulk going on. When you use a thinner thread, you lessen up that bulk. Um, 60 weight thread is great for, um, for small lettering. S the way the thread weight works is that it's a little bit opposite as far as the number goes. And the reason is, is because how they come up with weight is that however many, um, however many uh, kilometers of thread equal a kilo of thread or a kilogram of thread, then that is going to determine the weight. So um, if you have 40 kilometers equal one, and you have 60 equal one, that means you have more thread for the 60 weight, which it's thinner. You know, you need, you need more of that thread. You go 12 weight, which is really thick, you know, kind of like they have like this wool um, type of thread, and that's going to be thicker. So you go down in number, it's heavier. You go up in number, it's thinner. So there is 60 weight thread that's out there. There's quite a bit available. And I would also recommend using the polyester because it is strong. Um, when you do get to thinner thread, um, I typically tell people too that you want to use a thinner needle or a smaller needle, smaller in diameter. And that is going to create a hole, a smaller hole in the fabric. So it's lessening the bulk as well. So you're making a smaller needle penetration, you're making, you're using smaller thread or thinner thread, the twist of the thread is, is thinner, and it's going to be more crisp when it comes out. Now, of course, you do have to take this into consideration when you are digitizing. Sometimes, you know, with using that smaller thread, I like to bump up the density just a tiny bit. You know, I like to make it a little bit more dense um, because I am using a thinner thread. So with the needle size, I typically tell people to use a 65.9 or a 68. Um, on really, really, really tiny lettering that I've seen that's maybe two millimeters, three millimeters, we're talking about maybe a 55.7 needle, which is super tiny, and a 70 weight thread. But for your average smaller, um, smaller lettering, I recommend a 65.9 or a 68, and a 60 weight thread. So uh, there's a good test for your, your thread going through the needle. The thing that you want to know is that, or you know, the thing that's important is that you want your thread going through the needle with no friction. That friction, if it's rubbing against, you know, the inside of the needle hole, it's going to create, you know, it, it, it's going to, you know, create like a caterpillar. It's going to shred the thread, and it's just you're you're going to have you're you're going to hate it um, because it's just going to constantly tr shred the thread. So um, one test that I've learned is that if you put your you take your thread and you put your needle on the thread, and you hold one end of the thread in each hand, um, let that needle dangle and tilt that thread up and down. And you will see if, if it's catching on any of that thread. So you're just kind of um, seeing how it travels through that thread. If you see that it's catching, then you're going to have problems. If you see that it's not catching, then that's good to go. Another thing that I would recommend, um, and I do this a lot more with metallic thread just because it has some fibers in it, but you can also take a little bit of oil. Now make sure it's the oil that's not going to stain anything, um, but put it on your finger and then wipe it on the front of the needle. Kind of helps a little bit with that, um, you know, with that needle or that, that thread going through. So those things are, are important, um, you know, in using smaller thread and smaller needles. It's, it's amazing what difference that can make. You could have this, you know, as a test, if you do have time, I know time is, it's hard with, you know, some of our businesses, but if you do have time, stitch something out in smaller lettering or smaller detail in 40 weight thread, and then stitch it out in 60 weight thread. It, it's amazing what difference that makes. Um, so yes, you would use a smaller needle, like a 65.9 or 68 with like a 60 weight thread. You can get a lot of that through, um, through Madeira, 
um, Madeira does have a lot of colors in that 60 weight thread. And even in their thread chart, it does show like what colors um, have both 40 weight and 60 weight. And I've even used on designs, um, let's say you've got a design that's a one color design, but it has small lettering, um, you know, underneath the design. I've digitized it to where you ha you make the small lettering one color, but you're actually, you know, a different color than the design, but you're actually programming it on the machine as the thinner weight thread. It's the same color, but one's thicker weight and one's thinner weight. That way you're not having to use more stitches on the, the actual logo than you are on the, um, than you are on the lettering. So I always preface, you know, small lettering, utilize that small thread and that small needle. Um, because you, what you want to do, your goal is to create the least amount of needle penetrations and the least amount of bulk in that small area. So, um, to the digitizing part, and actually let me open the, um, okay, so 65.9 needle and the 60 weight thread, you can go to Madeira Mart, they have, um, they actually have some, I think they have some packages for the, the 60 weight thread. And if you do, if you've never bought from them, tell them that um, we sent you to them, that ZSK sent you to them. I think they have a little incentive discount. But Madeira does sell the Gross Beckert needles, which is, that's what we recommend. That's G-R-O-Z and then uh, B-E-C-K-E-T-T, -T, I think. Um, they have, there's so many different needle types. Another thing, kind of as a side note, is that um, I would recommend um, looking and exploring and understanding different needle types, different needle, you know, the tips of the needles are very different and they can make a huge difference. So um, going to the Gross Packet website is really helpful. It's It has a lot of great information. Um, as far as the oil, um, I can't remember the name of the oil that I suggest for the, the needle. It's just something that's not going to stain your materials. I know the the oil, the spray oil that ZSK um, provides, that oil does not uh, stain the fabric or anything like that. Um, just make sure you're using an oil that has those attributes. Um, and you don't have to use that much. Um, so the 7511 needle, um, that's going to be a bigger needle. That's typically what we use um, for you know, just, it's kind of your average size needle. So it is going to be bigger, you know, as far, the the size actually is, you know, 75 is kind of the metric size, and that means that it's 0.75 millimeters around. Um, so if you think about it, you know, 65 is 0.65, 60 is 0.6, so you're going down and down in size. And when you have needle points right next to each other, and let's say your needle's bigger, those needle points will kind of run into each other in a sense, you know, and, and possibly shred the thread, break the thread, or, um, you know, make a hole uh, into the fabric. Whereas, um, using a smaller, let's say you have those, and, I, and I'll just use, I'll go on here and use something as an example. I'm going to go over here to insert stitch, and I'm going to left click for my first point, and I'm going to go to a distance about uh, a millimeter. Let's see if I can get that. Okay, enter. We're going to zoom in pretty close here. So I'm going to show our needle penetrations, and this is a millimeter. Now if our, um, this stitch is about a millimeter, if our needle goes into this point, realize that it's making a circle, you know, 0.5, let's say we have a 75 weight needle, or a 75 needle. So um, that's going to go, oh gosh, I can't do math, um, <laughs> you know, 0.75 you're going to have just a little bit in between thread here, in between each needle penetrations. As you go down in your size and your circle, you know, your needle, you're going to have more thread to show. 
So, you know, let's say we'll do 80. Um, so you have 0.4 and then you have 0.4. Well, you have, that's 0.8, so you have 0.2 of thread that would actually show. If you go down to 60, it would be 0.3 and 0.3, and then you've got 4, 0.4 millimeters to show. So as you go down in size, you have more thread that's going to allow, that's going to show between needle penetrations um, because of the circumference of the needle. So using, and now, when you get down to small stitching and you have those stitches close to each other, you know, you need to make sure that your stitches aren't too close to each other. So you want to make sure that you don't have too thin of lettering or anything like that or, you know, too thin of a, a, a satin stitch. You can do thin, but you have, to real, you have to utilize the right, you know, recipe for that. You have to utilize the thinner thread, the thinner needle, and things like that because if you do have that, you know, 40 weight thread or even 30 weight thread and, you know, a thicker needle, you could run into problems because that needle could go into, you know, could rub against that other needle penetration and, you know, create, you know, slicing the thread. So I hope that makes sense. Um, you know, it's, it's good to, what I would do is explore with that 60 weight thread. It's, it's really helpful. So I'm going to go to a new design, and we are going to talk about the digitizing properties of small lettering. So I'm just going to go to insert text here, and um, let's go ahead and now with small lettering, one thing that I do recommend is keeping the lettering more simple, you know, keeping it maybe like a, a, a block. Um, we're just going to do an aerial right now. I'm just going to deselect bold here. And we're going to do about five millimeters. I'll leave it um, at, as that and then press OK. Now, when we zoom in, right click off to the side, I'll go ahead and hit the Go button. And you can see that the inside of our letters, we need to be aware of this, um, of, you know, how much it would actually close up. Uh, this distance around here, um, making sure that you have enough distance where that E is not going to close up, the A is not going to close up. We can change it. Um, we can change it in the edit outline mode, but we can also change it, um, you know, with the stitching. Now, the thing is with the stitching, there are things that I recommend, um, and there are settings for small lettering, um, like I showed you, but we can, what I'd like you to do, you know, is experiment and get your lettering options that you like and save over the default. So one thing, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this, I'm going to copy it, so I'm hitting Control C, and then I'm Contr Control V, and I'm just going to bring it up here. So I'm going to have one at regular default settings and then one where we're going to go ahead and change the settings. So first thing is I'm going to right click hold and drag a box over the entire part of the lettering. And again, you do have small lettering settings that you can default to, but I just want to go through those changes so we can see exactly what we're changing and why we're changing it. So with this selected, I am going to go to my stitch properties, property settings right up here at the top, and I am in the satin tab. I am going to take my basic step and I'm going to bring it down, and this is my average stitch length. I'm going to bring it down to about two millimeters, and again, that's my average stitch length. I'm going to go to the underlay tab. Now, I do like to have underlay quite a bit on my lettering. Um, sometimes you will ha not have underlay and sometimes you will. It really depends on your design. I do like to have lettering, or I do like to have underlay, but the zigzag is too much. I'm going to left double click on, and right now I would have no underlay. So if I were to hit apply right now, you can see that my underlay is going to go away. 
I'm going to do an underlay, but I want the stitch length to be smaller than the default settings. So I am going to choose a center run underlay. I'll double click on it. And my I have a maximum and minimum step. My maximum step is too big, in my opinion. Um, this maximum step I'm going to change to, um, I'm also going to change it to two millimeters. Um, I, you know, I like to do between two and three, just depends on how big the lettering is. Um, so I'm going to put it on two millimeters. And so that's going to make my uh, center run underlay have a maximum stitch length of two millimeters and a minimum of 0.4. This is a little bit extreme. Maybe I want to go to 0.8. And um, we'll go ahead and hit apply. And when I hit apply, um, you can see that I do have a center run underlay. But it's there's the settings for the center run underlay. So what is selected is center. What's available is over here, but I don't want anything else. Sometimes with wider lettering, I will do an edge underlay. And again, I will change the maximum step and sometimes the margin. This is too thin to have uh, an edge underlay, um, but if you had a thicker, um, you know, maybe thicker, a little bit bigger, I would probably do an edge underlay, but again, change the maximum step. The margin, that is how far inside the blue and white flashing line your, um, your underlay will go. So sometimes I'll even take that to a 0 0.2 or 0 0.3. And again, we're working in millimeters. The next thing is pull compensation. Typically with the pull compensation, I like to go about half, so of a standard value. The pull compensation means that the stitching is going to extend beyond the blue and white flashing line on each side according to the stitch angle. So for example, on my W here, it's stitching left to right. That's my stitch angle. So it's going to go on the left and right side. Whereas on the E here, you see my stitch angles change, and it's going on either side of that stitch angle. So I'm going to change that to 0.2. So that's about half. And sometimes, you know, you might go from, you know, I've gone from 0.17 to 0.23. You know, it, it really depends on what you're working on. I'll hit apply. So you're making that much skinnier. Maybe I, I want to open it up just a little bit more. Oops. And I kind of like that right there. You know, I don't want it too small. Like, I, you know, I don't want it to where you're going to lose it because I have to look at those needle penetrations and how far apart they are from each other. You know, if they're too close together, I'm going to have problems. So I need to look at that. The cross value, what that is, is how far inside, you know, like the end here, how far inside it's going to cross over when you have um, stitch directions going in opposite, you know, like perpendicular to each other. Sometimes I take this down a little bit, maybe to point two, um, and you can see that it doesn't go too far inside. It, again, it just depends, but um, it, I would look at it and kind of gauge by your font. There's not one setting that's going to be perfect for all small lettering, but you're going to see, as you understand these settings, why I'm doing it and why we're changing these certain things. I will then go to the Satin tab. With the Satin tab, the one thing I do like to deselect is the auto stitch shortening. You can see here in the E, the auto stitch shortening, and in the B, uh, it'll do a long stitch and then a short stitch, long stitch and then short stitch, which is good for larger letters, but not for smaller letters because then it's going to pull that fabric and it's making smaller, um, you know, a smaller width right there. So I'm going to deselect auto stitch shortening. Here I'm also going to make my maximum step, I might make it uh, three millimeters. And, you know, if your lettering is wider than three millimeters, then you're going to get that break long stitch. Um, or you can just deselect this break long stitch, make your maximum step three, and then it, if it has to go over three, it will. The density, my thing is I like to go to 0.38 if I'm using the 60 weight thread and the 65.9 needle. So I'm going to go ahead and hit apply here. You're going to see that stitch shortening change. 
So it now goes all the way to the inside here. And then I'll hit OK. So if I right click off to the side, you're going to see a big difference between this one and this one. You know, and the reason is, is, is these settings that we've changed, that pull compensation is a big thing. I also like to go through and change my in and out points so I have the least amount of travel and the best way to stitch. The in and out points are going to be where we start stitching and where we end stitching on that area. So if I right click on an area, I've got an in and out point here, and I see that the in point starts here and out point ends here. Now, it is going to do um, closest point connection in that the output out point on the W is going to be closest to the end point of the E. Same between the E and the B. Well, sometimes I like to change it. Actually, a lot of times I like to change it. I'm going to take the end point. Well, first of all, when I am right click selected on this W, you can see that the stitch count of that specific um, letter or what I'm selected on. I'm going to take the end point and I'm going to bring it up top here so that I I can see I've got some travel stitches and I want to eliminate the travel as much as possible. So I'm going to go ahead and generate and it's going to just going to generate that W and when I do that you can see it brought the stitch count down a little bit. Not much but a little bit. It did eliminate some stitches. There are times where I can divide up the letter and I think we'll go into this uh, next time. We'll kind of have a continuation I think of lettering um, into the next webinar. The next, um, the E, I actually like it to start like I would write it, you know, start inside here and end it where I would end it if I was writing it. So I want it to go around and down. Let's go ahead and regenerate. And it looks a little bit cleaner. You see that? Look how much cleaner this, this E looks than this E. Um, with the B. Let's go ahead and I'm actually going to start it down here and let's end it down here. I want it to, I actually might want to change the the stitch order. Well, you know, sometimes I, I struggle with this. So um, we're going to leave it up there. I'll go ahead and generate and it's cleaning it up little by little. So um, you keep an eye on the left hand side that we do have our you know this is showing me the order so I'm seeing the in and out point and the in and out point and you can see whenever I'm selected on an area it's going to select it in here and then I've got the in and out maybe I want to I can move that down I'm going to try and eliminate this stitching right here generate right click in here right click off to the side and generate and I think what we'll do in the next um, webinar and I apologize didn't realize it would take so long but um, talking more about small lettering how we can go and break apart the lettering and how we can actually you know improve it even more um, the R right here we'll do the in point there the out point there generate or cleaning it up a little bit so you can see from the top to the bottom the changes that we made and if I like those changes and I want to use that as my baseline I can save those changes um, the changes are the the small lettering stitch that we do have in the program if I go ahead and right click hold and drag and this is on 2.0 um, if I go to default this this is my stitch settings and I'll go down to small lettering it does change but it may not be the, the small lettering uh, settings that you like. You can go in and change your small lettering settings. If I like this setting on the W, I change that setting. Let's go to our property settings here. I can see these are all the changes that I made. I changed the basic step to two, the underlay, you know, the to a center run along with the maximum minimum steps, the pull compensation, the satin settings, so on and so forth. I have those settings in here because I applied them to the W. If I want to save those settings, I'm going to hit save. 
I want to go to the specified folder. Now this is important. Typically it goes to the folder by default, but if you can't, if it's not, go to the C drive and in the C drive go to your super tech folder, go to the IDS folder, scroll down to properties, double click on properties, and here you have your different settings. You can name it as a new setting, but if you want that setting in your text, um, that text box, and we'll see that in a second, it's this one right here, small lettering. I click on it, or like I said, I can name it a new one, hit save, it'll write over the old one, yes, and okay. So now, if I go to a new design, I'll go to insert image or insert lettering. I'll click on this small lettering stitch. Go ahead and hit OK, and then hit Go. It will apply those settings there. So if I right click here, just a quick way to show you is that I've got 0.38 in my density. So you do already have those those settings, and then you can go through. Now the in and out points you might have to change again. Um, because your lettering is always going to be different. So, um, okay, so that, well, you know, unfortunately I went a little bit um, over time. Um, so does anybody have any questions so far? So I think what we'll do next time is we'll, we'll have a continuation of the small lettering. We'll do the, uh, the fonts that we you know, buy as, as stitch files and uh, talk about that too. Um, we'll go over the the foam settings, how those, how that works and the technique for that and then also outlining. Um, I think those are great things to go over next time and if you have questions in the meantime, please feel free to email me. Um, I did look in the questions box. We had, we had great questions. Um, this again is recorded so um, you know you can access it later um, my email address is just Andrea a n d r e a at z s k machines dot com uh, there's a great point that's brought up a, a cheat sheet of the properties tab would be good um, I don't have um, I don't have anything like that um, but I'll tell you what I will try and make it um, I'll try and you know make it for you, and uh, and do it that way, um, or or have it on as a download on our website. So again, um, thank you all for attending. I hope to see you in the next class. I'll send you an email link with it, and like I said, if you do have any questions in the meantime, just let me know. Um, I'm going to sit on here for about five minutes. If there's any other questions, you can type it in the question box and. Um, you know, if, uh, otherwise you can just leave the webinar. Um, I will end the webinar too, so it will automatically kick you out if you, if you don't leave yourself. <laughs> so again, thanks for coming. And if there's anything else, um, if you have any feedback, that's another thing. If you have any feedback, please email it to me. Um, anything that you would want to learn as far as in future webinars, I'd love to hear. So question, the next, um, the next webinar, um, when you do sign up, I believe you sign up for all of them, and it should be on that list, but uh, I have here July 13th. So we're doing this one a little bit closer than what we usually do, um, but yeah, we have uh, July 13th, and then after that, August 15th, September 12th, October 17th, November 14th, and December 19th. And that's for 2017. So, So a question on um, what types of files can be inserted. Um, raster files can be. 
um, like JPEG, TIF, uh, GIF, PNG. Um, what are the other ones? Uh, the only vector file that can be imported is, excuse me, is the um, WMF. And if you are um, using a vector program, there is a way to export as a TIFF file that the program reads very nicely. Um, whenever you are in your uh, vector program, export or save as, however your vector program works, as a TIFF file, it's a TIF. I would recommend saving it as a RGB color profile because that's how um, threads are dyed. And then also um, make sure the option of anti-aliasing, A-L-I-A-S, is not on. Um, that throws in extra colors into the design. You don't need your DPI very high. If you make it high, it makes the image uh, file itself very big, and that can slow down the computer. So, um, you know, that is one thing that I do recommend. All right, thanks again to you guys for, for coming. I really do appreciate it. Okay, so I'm going to end the webinar, and uh, you'll see that link in your mailbox within the next uh, day or so. Take care, guys.